Good morning, friends. I greet you in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And let me say it's good to see all of y'all in here today. Uh, we've got some people coming back for the first time. Uh, and, and our old faithfuls. It's, it's good to have everybody here today. A uh, few announcements. We had 25 in Sunday school. Now, if we could just add 25 more, I think we'd be in pretty good shape. So everybody that's staying home, come on. Uh, the April newsletters are in your church mailboxes. Uh, since we've been having services, we haven't been mailing as many. So please check your, your church mailbox out here. And last but not least, this Friday at 6 o'clock, we will have a Good Friday worship service. Uh, so everyone's welcome to come join us for that this Friday. Are there any other announcements this morning? Well, okay. Uh, today is Palm Sunday, so let the festivities begin. God, it's a celebration day today. I've been taking down the tape a little bit at a time, just so y'all know. So I got some ammo if, if y'all decide to doze off in the form of a tape ball. So if you look around and you see somebody sleeping and you're sitting next to them, you might want to move. I, it's been a long time since I've thrown anything. Uh, we move into our prayer time this morning, and the prayer list is included in your new bulletin, or in your new newsletter. Uh, does anybody have any other joys or concerns this morning? Raymond Cox, the Raymond Cox family. Are there any other joys or concerns? Let's keep Carmen Carmen Pritchett in our prayers. Um, it's not long. Are there any other joys or concerns? Well, I'll stand here in a moment of silence, and then I'll offer a pastoral prayer, and then we'll all join together in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray.
Holy God, thank You for the gift of another day that we can worship You. Thank You for the storms in life so we know when we have peace. And thank You for the farmers and the ranchers so we have food on our tables. Thank You for the warmer weather so we can hear the children's voices outside as they play. And most of all, thank You for sending Jesus to live the life and suffer in our place to die the death that we could not die. Thank you that in his life, death, and resurrection, we are reconciled to you. And thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to dwell in us so we have your still small vo voice with us all the time. Guide us with that voice so we will live in accordance with what you have called us to do and to be which is to be more like you. We have freedom that, in your own, that your only Son has provided for us, but those freedoms need protecting. And we thank you for the men and women that have stepped up and offered their lives so we can enjoy that freedom. We also ask for their protection and peace for their families during times of separation. Since you are always with us, we know you have heard all of our joys and our concerns this morning, and we ask that your will be done in each of these situations. We ask for your healing where there is pain, your peace where there is strife, and your light where there is darkness. Remind us that you only have good planned for us and plans to prosper us. Hear us now as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And he bore with every step the 
scorn of those who cried out for his death. Down the Via Dolorosa called the way of suffering, came the Lamb, came the Messiah, Christ the King. But he chose to walk the road out of his love for you and me. Down the Via Dolorosa all the way to Calvary. The blood that it cleanses the souls of all men may its way through the heart of Jerusalem. Unfortunately, I have to stand up and preach after that. Our gospel lesson this morning is Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Would you stand with me for the reading of the gospel? <clears throat> when they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you. And immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and they found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. 
Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heavens. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pray with me and for me this morning, friends. Heavenly Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our Lord, our Rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. I did an internship while I was in seminary, and I worked under a man named Dr. Wade Arp. And Wade had bad allergies, somewhat like I'm going through right now. And for the couple of weeks that he had his bad reactions to the allergies, he would begin his sermons the way that I want to begin this one for you today. If my voice goes out, I'm sorry. But I want you to hear my three-point sermon for when my voice goes out. Okay? God loves you. I love you. Go in peace. Okay? So now you've had my three-point sermon for the day. So if my voice shuts down or if I fall down in the floor up here... You have had your biblical sermon for today. Amen? Now, with that said, I, I heard somebody say, well, now we can go home. Uh, with that said, I, I want to say this. In today's text, you have heard the quickest prophecy and fulfillment thereof there is in the Bible. Okay? When Jesus sends the two disciples into the village, you will find a cult there. That's a prophecy. Okay? And if somebody says to you, if somebody says to you, why are you doing this? You tell them the Lord needs it. There's Jesus' prophecy. Here's what Mark says. They went and found a colt outside in the street tied to a doorway. If a guy you know named Brad had written this gospel, Brad would have added the line, just like he said. It was just like Jesus said it was going to be. Half the prophecy is fulfilled in three verses. Then some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying the colt? They answered and told them, just like Jesus said. Brad would have written down at the bottom, just like Jesus said it would be. In four verses, we have the quickest prophecy and fulfillment there is. Unless you believe like the atheists do, that somehow Jesus snuck off in the middle of the night and prearranged all this, and nobody knew about it, and then Jesus snuck back and then sent the disciples. I don't believe that either. I believe this is purely prophetic, and it was just like, it turned out just like Jesus said it would. Now they brought the colt to Jesus and they threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. I don't know if y'all remember the joke that I told y'all about the little boy that turned 16 and he got his driver's license and he said, Dad, I'm ready to drive the car. And the dad said, As soon as you get your hair cut, you can drive the car. And the kid said, but dad, Jesus had long hair. 
And the dad said, yeah, and Jesus walked everywhere he went, too. This is the only time that you ever read that Jesus rode anywhere. And this is also the only time that you read that Jesus was seated above everybody else until he gets to the cross. Now there are a few reasons for that, and we're going to get to them uh, a little bit later. Um, but let's look at the colt for just a minute. They brought Jesus an unridden colt. And for a king to get on an unridden colt, or in the other synoptic gospels, it's donkey. For the king to get on a donkey or an unridden colt is to set out and to approach another king. Y'all know they were always at war back then. Somebody was always trying to take over somebody else's kingdom. So one of the kings that actually had a brain would go out and try to make peace and that way they didn't have to fight the war. Well, the king that's coming out on the peace, on the mission of peace, would ride an unridden colt or on a donkey. And they would try to, to begin the pre peace process so hopefully there could be a treaty. So here you have Jesus surrounded by people and he's getting on this unridden colt to go out to go and try to make peace. Um, it, so they spread their cloaks on the road and others spread the leafy branches. They are beginning the movement with Jesus lifted up on the colt. Um, and as they are traveling, and, and I want us to, to really consider this, as they were traveling, they, the people began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Now, it's always struck me as odd that that word Hosanna is in our monthly communion blessing. And most of us have no idea what it means. It literally means save us. Save us. So they lifted Jesus up. They put Jesus on an unridden colt. They are yelling that this is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. A, a quick side note here. Y'all know that King David still today is Israel's favorite king. He is their favored king. If you go ask an Israelite today, Hey, who, who is y'all's favorite king in history? They will tell you David. So here's this group of people that are surrounding Jesus and they are believing that Jesus is going to go into Jerusalem and overthrow the Roman rule of Israel. For those of you that are seeing this online right now, and for those of you that will go back and watch later, I will name this sermon. And the sermon title is going to be Confusion. Not getting what you want, but getting what you need. And as this group of people was shouting, Hosanna, save us! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They are shouting that they want to be delivered from what they could see. And what could they see? They could see Romans. And the Romans were oppressing them. They were taxing them. They were beating them. They took over about 150 or 160 years B.C. Depending on whose history you read, it was the end of the Maccabean Revolt. Or it was a civil war between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they had taken over. I believe God saw something a little bigger than the Romans. 
I believe that God was trying to save the people from their own sin. Let's get our working definition of sin out here. Anything that gets between you and God. Anything that takes away your passion or your lust for God and the knowledge of God. That thing, and these are Susanna's words, that thing to you, no matter how good it may seem, is sin to you. So there's our definition of sin. And God sent Jesus to deliver us from that. It's not something out here. It's, it's, not, it's not the boogeyman that's going to sneak up on you. It's something in here that inside your own psyche and inside our own selves, we allow to get between us and God. One thing I've struggled with is YouTube. I get my Bible out and I sit down to read and I bump my mouse and my computer screen will come on. And guess what's there? A YouTube video that I really want to look at right now. So I set the Bible to the side and Start clicking on the YouTube videos. That's taking my focus away from where it should be, right? So, that's what Jesus came to redeem us from. Because God had a much bigger, bigger plan than what they could see at the time. Everybody knew what the word Messiah was, and they had a big expectation of Jesus to be the Messiah, to take the place of a king and rule over Israel. Kick the Romans out and rule over Israel. That's why Jesus had to be related to King David. Uh, they also knew that Jesus was from God and they wanted their independence back from the Romans. They wanted their freedom uh, but here's, here's the question. Where was God in all of these? Where is God in, in this yelling? And what is God up to? What did God want for the people? God was looking for a way to restore a relationship with humanity. And more broadly, um, Paul writes this way better than I can say it. Um, Paul wrote, in Adam, all of creation fell. And in Jesus, all of creation could be redeemed. And that, that's not an exact quote, but that's, that's something similar to, to the way Paul put it. That it's not just us that are fallen. All of creation has fallen. And so here comes Jesus to redeem us. Maybe next year we'll be back to having the kids down here. And I always like to do uh, my children's sermon right around Easter. I bring one of those little stamps. You know, the kids get the stamps on the hand. I, I stamp all the kids' left hands. And then I take one of those little hand wipes and kind of smear it a little bit. That's the image of God that God gave all of us. And sin came along and made it a smeary mess. But then I get the kids by the other hand and I give them another stamp. Because in Jesus, God's stamp of approval is restored to the way.